morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's Dr. Janice Hooker-Fortman with Relationship Matters. I hope everyone is doing great. Well, I thought I could get off of my soapbox, but unfortunately, I can't. Now, what is my soapbox all about? It is about the virus. Now, what we are finding is that there is a new strain called Omicron. I think that's the way you pronounce it. And what the government is doing and doctors are doing is to urge everyone who has not received the vaccine or the booster to get it. Now, I know they don't know yet about, uh, you know, um, how virulent it is or how contagious it is, but be on the safe side. If you haven't received your vaccine, get it. If you haven't received your booster, get it. Now, I know, as I've said before, there are quite a few people that I know and people in my audience um, that for some reason or other, they don't want the vaccine. Uh, one person told me, well, I don't know what's in it. And uh, as I said to the person, well, you know, when you were going to school, um, you had to get vaccinated and you didn't know what was in it. And we don't know what was what's in a lot of stuff. But if you think about it, and if you've seen people uh, with COVID, if you've had friends or family members with COVID, you know, you don't want it. So I'm going to keep on this soapbox until we've wiped it out or until at least maybe 80% of the population has taken the vaccine. So that's it. Um, I'm going to come off of my soapbox. So now let's talk about my magnificent guest that I have with us today. Her name is Lynn McLaughlin. Let me tell you a little bit about her and then she's going to expound on it. Lynn's mission is to lead and empower people to make conscious and positive choices when faced with crisis. And all of us, I'm sure at one time or another, or even right now, have faced crisis. She gives people the opportunity to share their own voices through her podcast, which is called Taking the Helm. And we're going to talk about uh, her podcast a little later. She's an author through her writing, and she helps aspiring authors publish their own books. She is a, I should say, she's a best-selling and award-winning author. She's also an international speaker, and she leads people in tackling barriers so that they can move forward to new and exciting possibilities. Now, Lynn, I'm going to talk about this. She was the superintendent of education before retiring in September of 2018. And she continues to teach future educational assistance at her local college. So since I am a retired educator, I'm going to talk about that. She is well versed in all areas of special ed. And guess what, Lynn? I was a special ed teacher. Uh, and school and board operations. And although she would say it was a lifetime ago, she retired as the executive officer of HMCS Prevost after 13 years in the Canadian Forces Naval Reserve. And she is also a brain tumor survivor. I'm going to bring to you now Lynn McLaughlin. Hi, Lynn. 
Hi, that was quite an introduction, Dr. Fortman. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know what? It's just some of the stuff, you know, I thought I'd be talking for another half hour if, yeah. if we went on to everything that you do. But I thank you very much for being the guest uh, this evening. And I know that um, we're going to have a good time. And I know that you have some very valuable information from for my audience. So you know what, I want to start out with this. Did you start in education first? Was that your first career? My first full-time career, yes. Like everyone else, of course, you know, when you're going through school and trying to find your own way, it was my first full-time career, absolutely. The Naval Reserves was before that, and that was part-time. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So now, before you were um, a superintendent, you taught? Mm-hmm. So what did you oh. teach? Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. I, I, I'm a three-year girl. <laughs> that's, that's the way I describe myself, Dr. Portman. I get that. I got to try something new every three years. So I've been around and around and around. I've worked through three different school boards in my career. Um, I started out as a French teacher, a core French teacher. And, and here in Ontario, what that means is back in the day, starting from grade one, children would get 20 minutes of instruction in French every single day. And I had a cart and went from class to class and I had puppets and it was such fun. And, uh, and eventually that got changed and it moved to grade four. And then I went into special education. I did program consultant, moved in. Um, and then there was an opportunity back in my hometown, three hours away from where my husband, my, my husband at that time and my children were all born up there. And I applied for a vice principalship. We both moved, took our family back home. My children got to know their grandparents much better, their siblings. And then that's where I started through administration. So vice principal, principal, and then uh, superintendent for the last six years of my career. So, and even in my schools, I think the longest school I was at was actually, I closed one school while well, the team closed one school. I was the principal of one school that closed and I was the principal of one school that opened and combined, they were eight years. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love special education, still do still do teach part-time, as you said, at the college uh, with our future educational assistants. There's a two-year program here um, that they work through, and then they're out in the field helping um, children and adults with special needs. So, Oh, okay. So when you taught special education, um, what disabilities did you teach? Learning disabilities or... Wow. Okay. So as a teacher, because as a superintendent, that was my entire portfolio. Every single diagnosis exceptionality was under my umbrella as managing that for the system of 35,000 students. But as a teacher, I was what we, we call here a learning support teacher, uh, which means children are two or three times a week. It was an elementary school for, for us. That means kindergarten to grade eight age uh, would come out for additional support with their program and their curriculum, maybe reading, maybe math a few times a week. And I was coordinating their programs, their services, and their individual education plan. Uh, that's changed a lot since I did that job back in the 80s, but that's what it was back then. Oh, okay. I was asking <laughs> because I taught special ed. Um, I taught in elementary school and high school. And uh, when I started out, well, back then, you know, they had different terminology, uh, but uh, I taught uh, kids that had behavior problems. And yeah. then I taught um, elementary and high school kids with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's that's uh, why, why I asked that. And uh, yes, uh, I still love uh, special education. And uh, even though I taught, uh, you, well, you started teaching French, French, uh, and I started teaching fine arts. <laughs> but in the end, yeah, ended up in um, special education and then on to to administration. So kind of have a, a similar, similar background. Absolutely. And so now when you left, uh, well, you left the Naval Reserve and then you uh, went into education. And so you retired from education. Then what did you do? Yeah, so that was just three years ago. But boy, I'll tell you, time flies. Time flies. I can't. I can't believe it's been three. It was three years ago, September. But the first, I'm. I'm. I'm one of these people that just has to do and go all the time. And I know there's a there's a part of that that isn't so healthy. But and I've gotten much better in the last few years. But I think it was three days after my official retirement date. I I was in front of a class at the college teaching. <laughs> so 
Yeah. And then I moved into this wonderful world of entrepreneurship and uh, I, you know, I had no idea all of this stuff was when, you know, you know, we're working in education and you're going in every day and you're, you're doing what you can to improve the lives and, and the futures of the students and even the communities that you're working in. And then there's this whole other world of people that are doing amazing things in these collaborative networks. And I just jumped right in and started to learn. And then um, I published my second book in that first year, I think that I was off. Yes. No, actually it was a year ago. So, but it took me two years to get my second book out and launched my podcast. We're going into our third year in January. So it's been a, it's been a whirlwind, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, Dr. Fortman, and I, I, I think you would agree with me. There are, there are people COVID I think has made people change their minds a little bit, but there are people that are staying in their jobs and I'll tell you, there's a whole new life out here that is less stressful. You pick and choose what you want to do that you enjoy. You've, I'm volunteering in our community as much as I possibly can. And, and the stress level has just come like, and if I don't want to do something, I don't want to do something. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. A friend of mine just retired and I just said, welcome to the club. <laughs> That's right. It's a beautiful club. It's a wonderful club. There's, it's true what they used to say. Like, how would you ever? I don't even know how I ever would have found time to work, uh, based on everything that I'm doing right now. And this is such a such more, so much more enjoyable and and uh, and and gives me more of a sense of purpose and fulfillment um, than. And I'm not trying to say in any way, shape, or form that I didn't think that um, my work impacted many, many children, many, many students over my career as yours did. Um, but that's what you're doing every single, single day. And you very often as a teacher, don't see the impact as you, as children get older in grade one, you could sure see the impact if they can't read in September and in June, they're leaving. Right. Right. And you can see the impact with special education most definitely. But, um, I don't, I don't know. I just see a daily, I, I just feel invigorated now and, and not pulled down and here, Dr. Fortman, the politics very often make it very difficult to navigate through things. Um, and, and towards the end of my year, that became quite tiresome. And and I, I quite frankly, had enough of it. <laughs> you know, is that just, I, I, you know, I thought that was just here. <laughs> but like you say, the politics, you know, and it's, uh, they'll say children first, but uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always. And, and in the end, that's why I retired. Uh, because the what I thought, and not just me, but uh, other people thought what was best to help kids, uh -uh. you know, because it was po it was politics involved and the money issues and allocating the money to places that, you know, as a teacher uh, and even sometimes as an administrator, you felt, you know, no, that's not what we need. But in the end, like you say, in the end, you know that you have affected several children's lives yeah. in, in a positive way. So, you know, uh, I love, still love teachers and still love educating. And actually you are still educating people. <laughs> so you are an educator at heart. I think it's intrinsic in us. I don't think you ever stop, right? It's just, it's, I, I think we'll both, you know, until our, until our dying days, we'll be educators. It's just in our blood. It, it, exactly exactly and so when you decided to go into entrepreneurship did you have something in mind like you know you wanted to go into public speaking or or so what did you have in mind and you're wow you are very very intuitive that's exactly what i had because in my previous role um, although I had a lot of anxiety about it and I had to learn to manage that, that, that anxiety speaking in front of audiences and, you know, trying to change mindsets and get people to think outside of the box was something that I, I did pretty frequently. Um, and I learned how to roll with it and I learned how to, you know, do the deep breathing and everything before, you know, so nobody would even notice that I almost passed out in the chair <laughs> before they called my name. Um, but yeah, I thought I was going to do uh, professional speaking. And I actually took a course from a gentleman um, named Michael Caruso um, from in Michigan. He's right across the border. I'm 45 minutes south of Detroit down uh, in the southern part of Ontario. And uh, we did virtual courses, but I went over and he's a Rotarian and I spoke at his Rotary Club and 
And, and ironically, after it was about six months, I think, with a group of us as we were learning from him, and he's a recognized international speaker, um, he challenged me. He said, you're going to you're going to be the host and, and I'm your guest on a, on a podcast show because he has his own pl podcast platform. And I went, OK, <laughs> OK. <laughs> and it was so awkward if you go back and listen and watch that first um, that first episode, because um, because of my my craniotomy, and I think it's part of it is growing old, older and things like that, too. I was so caught up on my memory that I wasn't even listening to what he was saying because I had to think about what the next question was going to be. And back then I thought, I have to look at the camera. I have to look at the camera. It's just expected. I have to look at the camera. So I got myself all worked up. Anyway, long story short, I still loved it. And I thought, this is really great. What a way, what a wonderful way to, to give people a platform and give people a voice. I just have to learn how to do it properly. <laughs> um, so I did a, I did a big trajectory turn there and thought, yeah, this is the way to go. And I was working on my second book and all of that at the time. Uh, and then uh, it, I was about four months later that I actually launched uh, Taking the Helm. And uh, oh boy, we've come a, we've come a long way. You, you know, Dr. Fortman, as you do it and you learn new things and new strategies and you know, how to reach your audience and what are the key messages. You just, you just learn as you go. Um, but I do wish, I do wish that I had gotten a coach right, right, right from the beginning, instead of grappling to figure things out myself. Um, there, I have a network of people now, um, a part of a, of a podcasting networking club, and it's pretty awesome. And we learn from and with, with each other, which is where I met you at the yes. podcast collaborative. So right. there you go. <laughs> right. And you're right about a coach. Uh, and I did the same thing, struggled. And uh, finally, uh, someone told me, you know, you, I, I had heard you should get a coach. Oh, I didn't get a coach where I can learn myself, you know. But finally, I did get a coach. And uh, in, I ended up with like two or three because different coaches do different things. But everyone who wants to really be successful, because you don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really does need a coach for where, wherever they are lacking. Now, you keep talking about your second book. Mm -hmm. So we skipped over your first book. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. That was in, uh, well, there's a little story behind there. And it, it actually links exactly with, to what you just said, because um, I, I was in the role of a superintendent at the time, and I just finished my first year. And uh, I was having these, Oh, extreme headaches for probably the six months before I did. So. Anyway, I would say I actually had symptoms for about two years and they and they built and they changed and they built in the change. But when you wake up in the morning on a regular basis with a massive headache, almost like a, a migraine and I never had migraines, I never had that history. And it's not because you had too much to drink the night before <laughs> and it becomes something regular. That's a, that's a real red flag. And so I had tinnitus, I had some dizzy spells, I had nausea. Um, I had some uh, different things that were happening and I went and saw a, 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 an ear, nose, throat specialist and okay, they weren't concerned. All of these things were happening, but I never actually sat down and thought, are they connected? I don't remember ever doing that when they were all connected to well, let me get to it. Um, my family doctor finally said, you're going for an MRI. And I sat up from the machine and they sent me right to emergency. And you know, right away, something's, oh, well, you're not oh. getting great news when you get sent immediately from the MRI bed down the hallway to the emergency room. And my husband was at work. He was a police officer. Uh, uh, no, actually he was sleeping. He worked the night shift. And they told me I had a brain tumor. Like, I was in this curtained room and I write about this in the book, you know, an emergency room where there's a curtain, there's a curtain, there's people over there, there's people all over. And they said that I basically was a walking, um, uh, I use the word death trap in my book. Uh, I, I could have uh, fallen into a stroke or a coma at any time. I could have killed someone on the highway. Oh. And yeah, it was, it was, it was so bad that my brain had actually shifted one full centimeter to the right because of the edema because of the oh, swelling. So uh, for everyone who's listening, ignoring the symptoms put my life at risk and it, it, it caused a great deal of trauma for my own family because things happened very, very quickly after that. I, I was thrown on steroids to shrink the swelling and boom, 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 and all of these intervention things. And three weeks later I had a craniotomy. 
And, and so stop in the superintendent role. <laughs> you're off work for a while. And when you're going to go back, if you're going to go back, you're, you'll be a totally, totally different person. So that's that book came about uh, probably about a year later. And I'm going to go on another tangent right now um, because I really felt my family and I, and this is a book written by myself and my family, w- would help people going through any type of like life crisis to grapple with those larger questions. Why did it happen? Why me? What's my purpose? And all those kinds of things. Um, but when I launched that first book, jumping to what you said earlier, I, I did it all on my own with a consulting company, but then they handed it over to me when it was finished. And I ended up two years later uh, doing a second edition to do it right because I didn't hire a coach. So I just jumped from the horrible, awful experience to the coach thing, which probably wasn't a good thing to do, but call me squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah. So so how long did it take you, you know, to, I guess, uh, I'm trying to think of the words, but, but to really convalesce and, and, you know, get back to your normal, regular life. Well, I, w- I never got back to that life. Uh, after brain surgery, you're not going to be the same person that you were. You have to find your new your new you. And and I go back to, I couldn't get out of bed after the after that craniotomy. I, my memory, my short-term memory, my long-term memory, my, my use of vocabulary. Thank goodness I had my speech and I had my mobility, but I had to build all of that back up. So uh, I write in, the book is called Steering Through It. I have a navigational theme to what I do is taking the helm, steering through it, you okay. know. Um, and it does take you through that whole process. I went through a period of extreme mania. There was one diagnosis of psychosis and it was all about reactions to medication and what my body was going through. So flash forward, um, eight months later, I wanted to go back to work. This is part of my not thinking so clear. I was ready to go back to work. I was ready to go back to work for Pete's sakes. I couldn't even think clearly. (laughs) So eight months later, um, through the brilliance of a man named Dr. Strang, uh, a neuropsychologist here in my area, we, I went back to work in that role um, on a graduated return return and job shadowing the amazing lady, Vicky, who was in there for me, an amazing leader. So for, uh, I think I went back in April, three days a week. And then by the beginning of June, it was four days a week. And then the summer holidays and September. In September, I took back my role totally. But I had to use digital uh, tools, uh, Dr. Fortman, because I couldn't recall things. So we created a system where my uh, secretary and other people in my department, we would all put a note that would be shared. I could read it. I could remember if I was calling back a parent, I would read the history things first. I would double check. And I just created a routine um, using reminders and all of those kinds of things. And despite the majority of people thinking I could never go back to that job, I did. It was not smooth sailing. (laughs) It was a rough three, four months and probably very much so for the people who are working with me thinking, what is this all about? But they were wonderful and kind and caring and held my hand and dragged me along. And, and, uh, and, and I did it for five more years, five more years. So, so it is about, and I'm, I, it is about, I, I, I want, I want to say, you know, we take for granted baby steps and you can take this into any context, mental health, anything, life-threatening illness, whatever it is. That first step of me just putting my legs over the bed. The next day, my nurse was taking one of my nurses was taking me to the to the shower, and I kicked him out. The next day, I was walking across my room and back. The next day, I was walking down to the lounge. So, what you might think, oh wow, I pushed myself up in bed today, or I I felt good enough that I could go out and have a cup of tea. That's a step. And when you take all of those little things and add them up, you can go so far. And then you look back and go, I like five days later when I was on my way home, oh my gosh, I could, I couldn't even put my legs over the bed five days ago. And so for me, that whole recovery was what's the next step? What's the next step? And I never, ever thought six months down the road because it was just, I thought it was impossible, but baby steps, next step, next step. And then you get to celebrate, celebrate a lot because there's a lot to celebrate, no matter how baby that step is. <laughs> wow. Wow. A, a question uh, came in. Um, and the question is, what advice would you give someone who has had a similar experience as you in order to get through it? Well, I, 
so for me, writing was a very big part for me. I mean, my, ch my children were teenagers at that time. My, my daughter was just turning 16 years old. My son was 14, about to turn 15. So, I mean, this was a, I, I'm my siblings. I mean, I have a, I'm very, very blessed to have a close family. Three siblings here in Ontario, two in Michigan. My dad happened to be there in the summertime. He's actually is a Florida resident, a U.S. citizen, and was visiting at the time and stayed. Um, I, I guess you have to find a way because you're human. We're all human. And you are going to go through whatever it is, those doubts, those questions, the what ifs. And if it's something where you have to make a treatment decision, you're grappling with that, with all of the information that's before you. This will work. This won't work. And I, for me, was writing. I started journaling again the day I was diagnosed. And because I was on steroids, Dr. Fortman, I was, woo -woo, you know, <laughs> through the night, everybody was sleeping. I was researching, I was writing, and I was putting my fears out there in a way that I felt was safe because I wasn't scaring my children or my husband. It, I felt I needed to do that in that time. I think I maybe open up, I don't know, I wouldn't, but for me, getting it out, being human, um, I, I, I said, I, I pushed people away who were negative in my life. I really did. I just didn't have any, I just couldn't let them in because I couldn't be pulled down because your mind and your body are absolutely connected. And if you're going to be negative, you're going to feel that negative. If you don't think you have a chance, your chances of getting up and putting your legs over the bed the very next day are a lot less because you don't believe you can. Yeah. You know how we push ourselves, right? We push ourselves to do. So to me, it's about getting into the right mindset. And I don't mean be nasty and mean and get out of my life, but you can, you can find a way to separate yourself from the negativity and focus on what you can control. That was so tough for me because I'm a control freak. I'm a control freak. I couldn't control what happened at work. I had to just turn it over and say done. I couldn't control. The only thing I I couldn't control what was going to happen on that surgical table. I couldn't control the way, whether or not I was going to wake up with speech or mobility. I couldn't control any of that. All I could say is I'm going to get myself as healthy as I possibly can. I'm going to take my medications as I can. I'm going to get out as much and I will make arrangements in case I don't pull through, even though I'm not going to believe in that it's still a part of your reality. So I guess my biggest thing is what do you have control over and focus on that? And your treatment choice is your decision. You do have control over that. And, and part of what I write about in the book is, and I ask, I ask people questions. If you don't agree with a loved one's treatment choice, don't put the pressure on them to say, I don't agree with you. You should be doing this as opposed to supporting them in that decision, because that's what people need. They need that support, not the questioning, not the, I think you should do this. It just puts more pressure on people that are already in a terrible place to begin with. Okay. Wow. And, and you are a true testament to, to, to overcoming something so serious. When you talk about overcoming barriers and, and looking at the possibilities, oh my goodness. But I, Lynn, I got to go to a quick commercial yeah. and then we're going to come right back. Cause there's some other things I want to ask you about, especially uh, with this, uh, you ran a marathon. I really want to know. <laughs> I really want to know about that. So we'll be right back.
we are back and uh, we have with us Lynn Mc. second book about the second book now I know that um, the I think it was called a half marathon but I'm interested in what the difference is I've lost you, Dr. Fortman. It's because you're using your husband's computer. <laughs> I think really. I'm live. Okay. 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 <laughs> right. You know, and I know we were both having internet kind of issues. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other day I was watching someone's program and they just completely went blank. And uh, so I don't know what's going on. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, tell us about this marathon that you ran. Oh, it was so exciting. It was pre-COVID. It was, uh, oh, I trained so hard. So it, it's a, it's the international marathon. So we go from, we go, so uh, if we can just envision the Detroit River goes, so Ontario has this boot that goes underneath Michigan, if you could just imagine that. And Windsor's at the top of the boot and Detroit is actually north of Windsor. Michigan is north of Ontario. And so we have a tunnel and we have a bridge and uh, annually, it hasn't happened for two years, uh, in, uh, oh, I want to say it was the beginning of November. It is, it is, oh my gosh, I can't even describe what it felt like. We, you show up at 5.36 o'clock in the morning, you all meet in Detroit and you get lined up. You're in letter M, B, M, N, O, P, whoop, off you go. And uh, it was 13 kilometers, which I think is, is that 21 no, 13 miles, which is 21 kilometers, sorry, in, in, in my terminology. And so we go along the streets of Michigan over the bridge, and they have one lane of traffic closed back then. So we're all scooting across the bridge, and some people are running. They're doing a full marathon, and some people are walking a full marathon. Then you go across the bridge and all the way through Windsor, and there's water stations and people cheering along the way. And, uh, and then you come around to the tunnel and the tunnel is totally closed because, you know, exhaust and all those kinds of things. And we go back through the tunnel all the way around Detroit again and come across this great big stadium with finish lines. And, and, uh, and the big, the big joke was, it wasn't a joke because I was really worried it was going to happen is don't get picked up by the truck that comes to pick up the stragglers. There was a name <laughs> for it. I can't remember what it was, but I actually did it in three hours and uh, 20, 20, three hours and 30 minutes. Um, and we had four hours to get it done. I can't tell you what it felt like to come across that finish line. I mean, I bawled. It was just, there's just so much adrenaline pumping because that last little while you got nothing left. <laughs> you really, I had nothing left, but I was really proud of myself. I was, how old was I at the time? 55, 56. And, um, and we started with a team and we all said, we're just going to each do our own. We don't want to hold anybody up or keep any, let's just all do our own. And we all made it. Uh, one person on our team uh, came across just after four hours. And, but I tell you, it was wonderful. I, I could never do it again right now. Uh, my body has just deteriorated in the last two years. But uh, yeah, and they've done the marathon in Michigan and in Ontario. And we do it, we've done it virtually where people just go and do it wherever they are. But we haven't come back together as an international marathon since, since that time. That was the last date. But it's really, really, truly something to push yourself to, to your limit. I trained for six months, six months, at least. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. 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 I'm blessed to be on, on a, the railway tracks across the street, across the street from a park have been torn out. And we have a, a trail, a walkway that goes the entire County 
um, an hour from one side to the other, which is fantastic for training. We don't have the inclines that, you know, some places in the world do. Um, but yeah, we are, I was, it was pretty driven and, and, you know, I was just, I was just one person doing a walking half marathon. There were people there that were 20. There was a, there was a man on the bridge, Dr. Fortman, who was 80 years old and he passed me on the bridge <laughs> running with his daughter and everybody knew who he was. Cause we did some media coverage on him and it was go, go, go. It was amazing. But to see, oh, I was just so inspired. I thought, wow, if he can do it, I can walk. <laughs> So what made you, what made you want to do it? It was just a friend of mine who, um, she, she's a, I don't know what you call the person. Uh, she's a dragon boat. She's the one who does the chant. Oh, she's the leader on the dragon boat. Anyway, she okay. just said, Hey, a couple of us are going to do this. Do you want in? And I'm like, why not? <laughs> why not? I'm retired. I can do it. I've got the time. And, and, uh, yeah, but I'll tell you at the end of that day, I, oh, Wow. I, I basically couldn't move for three days. I was so, I was in such rough shape. <laughs> I went and sat in a hot tub afterwards just to try to give the muscles a little bit of break, but I just went right to bed when I got home and slept for hours. <laughs> wow. That, that, that's wonderful. That, mm. that, that, I, I really admire you for that. I, I don't even think I, maybe I could have maybe 30 years 40 years, <laughs> 50 years ago. Oh, that's what I mean. The gentleman who was 80 years old, I just like, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he had run, I don't remember what his numbers was, but he, he numbers were, but he probably ran three or four marathons every single, every single year for his adult life. You know, I wish I could remember his name. Okay. But. Yeah. So, cause I guess if you're used to running marathons, running in marathons, so you can do it forever. Well, you know, they say, well, I know for a fact, you got to keep moving. If you can, you know, yeah. so the fact that he the was truck will come and pick you up if you don't. <laughs> yeah, right. The, the truck will pick you up. Right. <laughs> so tell, tell us about your podcast, Taking the Helm. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm inspired just I, as you are. I'm sure, Dr. Fortman, it's um. so you you said it in the intro. Uh, my mission is to uh, help people make conscious choices. Right. Because we get so caught up in all of this bull crap if I could say that word, I didn't swear, around us that sometimes we just get pulled in so many directions we need to refocus. And there are so many people that are floundering or or can't take that first step or don't know how to take the first step with whatever their struggle was. And, um, and so I started it two years ago, uh, like I said, we're in January. And every week, every Wednesday, I have a new guest. And it's someone who has experienced some type of a crisis in their life or business. But they actually think of that crisis as happening happening for a reason because they're in a much better place because of it. And I will say my brain tumor was my wake up call because I wasn't in a good place. I, I really wasn't. I wish the universe had been kinder to me <laughs> than, than that, but I, but I wasn't in a good place. So these people are remarkable. And, and, the, and, and when I hear a listener coming back to me and saying, thank you so much. I reached out to this guest and now I'm in a better place or I've taken my first step. Um, I had one guest who publicly came out on my podcast as being an alcoholic, publicly did it. Uh, five siblings all had passed away for something related to that alcoholism. She's the only one still with us. And I was so proud of her. And my goodness, is she making a difference to people today? That's what keeps me going. I actually was thinking about going bi biweekly, but every time... Every time I'm I'm interviewing someone, I just can't. There's just too many stories to tell. There's too many people that that have trouble finding their voice, but when they do, they got to have a platform to share it. And then it just spirals, right? That person who just took their first step starts to build confidence and then they start speaking publicly about things we should be destigmatized. I just I'm really really loving everything about it. Forget about the tech and all of those kinds of things that I, you know, sometimes I scream at my computer and <laughs> Um, I got it. <laughs> yeah, but it's called taking the helm because in steering ourselves in the right direction, again, that's my analogy. Um, and that, and that's what my guests are doing. And that's what I'm hoping, uh, people are taking, uh, taking from that. So yeah, I love it. So I know you told me about the alcoholic, but, uh, uh this question just, just came in. Uh, can you share with us someone you think was impacted the most from your efforts. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, the most. I don't I don't know that I can answer that question, but I can tell you 
uh, that I do get feedback from listeners. They don't put it in ratings and reviews publicly. And, and, I, and I understand why, and I don't want them to, but by um, uh, this, this lady, and I'll say her name publicly, Michelle Friesen, she's actually an equestrian, an, a, an equine healing person, helps people with horses. She's the woman I'm talking about. Uh, she, she called me and said within days, she had 20 phone calls. Some people reaching out to her from her past and other people are saying, I needed to hear this. How can you help me? So those people, I haven't, I don't have a direct contact with them, but I do through Michelle. But I'll tell you another little story. Um, and this is another one, a local woman. Uh, she, I found out that she had just been diagnosed with breast cancer and we, she just sent me something and I, I went, oh my gosh, I just interviewed Jen Schmers. She was diagnosed in stage four. She's doing amazing things. And I connected the two of them. And then I see them chatting with each other. So the lady locally now has a support network from someone else who was on the podcast. There's so many different stories like this. And, and there's, I'm sure that I hope there's a lot of other things happening behind the scenes that I don't know about, but boy, it would be great to have more of that feedback. Those are, yeah. Yeah. So these are two, just two examples, but the most I, uh, right now I would say I'm Michelle, Michelle, did I say Friesen? I meant Stein, <laughs> Michelle Friesen. I don't even know where that name came from. <laughs> Anyway, Michelle Stein. Yeah. And you said she's an equine healer. Yes. So she does she hor heals uh, horses. No, she uses horses to help people connect with themselves. It's oh, called really? equine therapy. Yeah. You can look her up. She's got a business here and a farm and she does, um, she does um, summer sessions with students. Oh yes. Equine therapy. It's, it's another way that people are finding peace and, and a way forward. It's, it's quite incredible. Wow, that is very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So now your, your second book. And your second book, the title is Jackson. And I'm going to see if I could find it. Uh, let's see. But while I'm looking for it, t tell us about that particular book. So that book came, uh, uh, that was just released actually a year ago. Um, I'm very, very proud of it. Although it's fictional, it's based on the real life experiences of, of really two people. Uh, a woman, a mother by the name of June and a young man, 25 year old man named Jackson. And Jackson is experiencing debilitating, it starts with anxiety and to the point um, where where it, it's affecting his everyday life. He moves to external validation drinking, drugs, very, very common. And it takes, so you, you follow the path of two characters, where this young man who's who doesn't understand why things are happening this way, who can't understand, I, I call it demons and desperation, that what's happening and, and isn't able to, to differentiate what's happening up here with his reality and gets pulled in, which is a very, very common thing. So the book goes through his journey. It does end there is a suicide attempt, I have to say, because that is a really very, a very real part of mental illness, but it does end with hope and it does end with love. But, and I, and I would say 40% of the character of Jackson was my daughter actually, who went through a very difficult two years of life. Who's doing very, very well. I have to say today And June is 60% me going through that with her. The other character you see is this mother who uh, is hell bent in saving her son. She will do anything within her means like most parents will, right? But gets to the point where she can't even function herself. She creeps on the phone. She sends messages hoping to get a response. She can't She can't sleep at night. She's not eating. It's just become debilitating because she doesn't know what to do. And so she goes through a journey of reaching out for help, learning what the boundaries have to be, getting to the point, which is the hardest, hardest thing for anyone who is a caregiver, child, parent, sister, brother, niece, nephew, to come to the realization that even with love and hope and being there on a dime, people are still going to make their own decisions. So those two characters hand in hand through the book and you see this back and forth, but each one of them come to a conclusion at the end that, have, that has taken them to a new, a really new and, and good place. It doesn't end, uh, it doesn't end with, oh, there's been a magic cure because <laughs> But it does end with there's a reality here that this will be with Jackson for his whole life. But how do we cope with this going on, knowing what's happening inside me? And how does the mother cope uh, knowing that this is part of his future with all of the highs and lows? So that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. 
Um, okay. it, it's really driving con my whole purpose in this is to drive conversations and get people talking about this because we shouldn't be waiting to be reactive when people are on the ledge or close to the ledge. We need to be back here in a proactive state when they're very, very young, we should be talking to our teenagers, Dr. Fortman, in my opinion, yes. I'm not a clinician, I'm not a clinician about suicide. We should be. And you've got a, a lady in, uh, in the United States, her name is uh, Jackie Simmons, who did a TEDx talk. And I'd be really interested in hearing what people's feedback is on this with four questions we should be our, uh, starting to talk to our teenagers about. And those four questions will tell you where your child is in terms of approaching crisis or not approaching crisis. And once we can start talking about this, it becomes a natural thing and not a taboo topic. When we can talk about our own mental health, I say like we like we do having a headache every day, then it just becomes more natural. And then we can do more proactive things, I think much sooner, much, much sooner than, than we have been. So. And you know, that's something, that's a subject matter or something that, um, all of us have been confronted with in one way or another, either either as far as mental health and and trying to do something of, about the mental health problems that people have. You know, mm -hmm. uh, at one point in time, you couldn't talk about it. <laughs> you know, uh, but now it's it's so important, and especially, I think now during uh, this COVID crisis because so, so many people really need some kind of help in order to, to cope with what's going on. So uh, um, anyone who works in mental health, I really applaud them. And anyone who seeks help, because a lot of times you, people don't, you don't wanna tell people that uh, if you feel like you you need a therapist, you don't want to ask people or tell people that you need a therapist because they see that as a weakness, and it, and it really isn't. So I, I imagine now the book Jackson and both books. How can we? How can my audience purchase? Oh, what it's on book? Amazon. Actually, I like the expression anywhere books are sold, but that's not true <laughs> the first, because, because the first book, you know, I, I did it, I did it pretty much myself, but they're on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, uh, I, you know, in the UK and Canada, I think they're in China, uh, uh, in the United States. Um, Goodreads is another way where you can, where you can find books and the links on my website. Everything is on my website. I've got, uh, it's called a shop, but you don't actually shop with me. It takes you to the links of where you can purchase the books. And, um, uh, Indigo's chapters, you can order it uh, from from them as well. So I'm 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 pretty happy about that. So do you use uh, either one of your books? Uh, now, do you? I know you have a podcast, but do you coach people? I well, I I've been kind of backing away with that a little bit, but but I do have. Um, I'm coach. I'm helping people as a coach to publishing. So what I'm, what okay. I'm, I'm not an editor. I'm not an editor in any way, shape or form. I can give people names for editing, but I want to help people through the, uh, what do I have to consider? What are the pros of traditional publishing? What are the pros of independent publishing? What are the pros of hybrid pro, um, publishing and the cons? So when people make that decision, they know where to go. And then there's lots of tricks and tools to the trade about how to do a cover design how to do your interior design that we can do at a reasonable cost, but we have to do it right. Or we do it, we do an injustice really to our fellow, fellow independent publishers. The, it, it is so overwhelming, Dr. Fortman, when you, if you, if you just start Googling, how do I promote my book? Oh my gosh, it, it's absolutely crazy. And there's too many scams out there as well. So I have a free consultation where people will give me a call. I will defer them or send them to people. If you want to do an Amazon ad, here's the man that you need to be following. Um, and if they want me for a session, then I will help with the session specifically to what they want to do. I don't give people a webinar. I don't send you off to a YouTube. We're going to be together for one hour at a time, but I have cut back on that. I'm doing one session a week right now, just because my podcast is just, uh, it's really kind of, um, it's taking more time and that's okay because it's all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this other question came in, um, and they ask. What does your future look like? Oh, wow. 
Well, I'm not going to have a recurrence. I don't know why that first, you know, why that first came to my mind because I had a conversation about that some, some with someone earlier because I have a 17% chance of recurrence. And I was, and I, and I said, I don't dwell on it, but I also I go back to the people who, who can financially retire and are still staying there because they're afraid of something. You know, don't wait till the brick hits you in the head to say, wait a minute, what am I having? A, if, if I'm walking out the door every morning and I'm tired or I'm not invigorated or I'm really not looking forward to going to work, then why do we continue to do that when we have an option to find something else that's joyous in our lives? So anyway, I will not become sick. I've got health. I'm going to keep walking. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep my health and my family as a priority. Um, I have all three of my adult children together for about 12 hours this Christmas. <laughs> They're all coming and going. I'm going to focus on my family travel. I can't wait to travel again, Dr. Fortman. And I'm going to keep going with my podcast. And, uh, and I've got a children's book series coming out with my niece very, oh. very soon. And it's about, it's about helping children with their emotions and giving them choices. So, and she's a social worker. So, you know, there's some brilliance there. What's my future. It's kind of like me. It's, it's squirrel. <laughs> Maybe someday I can I can bring it more in focus, but I I, I don't know. It's kind of I guess I can't multitask the way I used to, but I do enjoy doing different things. So okay, so now <laughs> if people want to join your podcast or just learn more about you, um, tell us. You have that lovely scrolling. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I, know what you're of you. <laughs> I have to learn how to do that. Yeah, it's all at lynnmclaughlin.com. You can find the podcast on any podcast app. And just this week, we uh, we expanded to iHeartRadio. And actually, if you go onto Amazon, you'll find my my ad my um, podcast ad because um, it because I'm on Amazon Music and Audible. And both of my books are in audiobook as well, which I think is very important because I, I find more and more people are doing that, walking, listening to podcasts, listening to books. And yeah, so just go to lynnmclaughlin.com. It's it's all there, but uh, tune in and I would really appreciate it. And I just started doing this. I don't know, Janice or Dr. Portman, if you can do this. I feel very awkward asking people to write reviews or to subscribe. It's it's I just feel awkward doing it, but someone has coached me to start doing that. Because to keep the podcast going, we do need supporters. So I've started to do that now, as awkward as I feel. <laughs> and since you said that, Lynn, <laughs> I would love <laughs> for you to review uh, tonight. I would appreciate it. And you're, yeah, you're right. You know, I thought about that the other day. With all of the different guests that I have had, I haven't asked one guest to write a review, yeah. a testimony or anything, you know, mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> you know, the question you asked earlier about, or uh, one of the, one of the viewers asked earlier, you, if you listen to a podcast and it means something to you, any podcast, write, write a comment, write a review. Now it's very hard on some, uh, Apple makes it very, very easy, but some of them it's almost impossible or send an email to the host because, you know, sometimes that's just so awesome to hear in it. You know, we have bad days too. Keeps us going. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we do. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for uh, Lynn for uh, being a guest. I mean, I uh, you have given us very valuable information, and I want people to definitely go to your website and definitely go to Amazon and find your books. It has been a pleasure. I am so happy I met you. And we have to definitely keep in contact. I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. So, Thank you so very you much. Have, I've been honored. Oh, it, for me, it's been an honor. So I want you to have a beautiful, blessed rest of your day. And, well, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and all that good stuff. Absolutely. You as well. It's 8 o'clock in the evening here. Actually, it's almost 9 o'clock in the evening. So, yeah, almost yeah. 8 here. So thank you so much. All the best to you. Thank you so much, All everyone. Right. Bye Thanks bye. for watching, listening. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, that that was really amazing to have her on. And uh, uh, one of our viewers, Sandy, said, I love your positive energy, Lynn. So I know she meant that for Lynn. And yes, same here, same here. Well, it's almost that time. Uh, for me to end the show, but uh, two things. Well, one thing, major thing. My birthday is 
Oh, I think Sunday. <laughs> December 5th. I will be celebrating my birthday. I am celebrating the whole month of December. And this is not to brag, but this is just to let people know, yes, you retire and then you do things that you want to do, that you are passionate about, and you just keep on moving forward. Because I don't know who's on here, uh, because I can't see the names, but I, what I would like you to do, uh, if you're looking on the Relationship Matters TV page or even my personal page, to let me know that um, you how you really um, enjoyed the show this evening, and then and and what you kind of what you got out of it. But the second thing is, I will be, and I know people don't believe it, and I'm blessed because of this, and I owe it to hereditary her, uh, right because it's not me but i've just been blessed to be in a family uh that has longevity and look young so i will be 80 years old on sunday december 5th and um i'm going to party like i'm 50 for the rest of the month so just thought i let you all know that and this is something I want you to, that I'm involved in. It's called Out With A Bang. We are going out of 2021 with a bang. There is a 15-day weight loss challenge. And you have to register on Eventbrite. It, um, and I'm in that 15-day weight loss because I ate like, I don't know what, for Thanksgiving and some of uh, my neighbor brought me a rum cake and I think I've eaten almost half. So, but anyway, so, so you go to Eventbrite, look for Out With A Bang 15 Day Weight Loss or Gain Challenge and register. So I want to thank everyone again for coming in on the show and listening to Lynn uh, with all of her valuable information and be sure and go get her book see you next week oh next week we have someone talking about relationships so ladies who have been asking me over and over again about how to find a man uh, how to get rid of toxic relationships how to be in a good relationship tune in next thursday 7 p.m central time 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 a.m. UK Time, 5 p.m. PST. See you next week. Bye-bye.